It is good to see so many people here this morning. It's good to see so many people here that we haven't seen here maybe before, or we haven't seen in a while. So uh, uh, we are glad that everyone is here. Have you ever found yourself in a situation faced with a need to make a decision on the spur of the moment, wondering what the right way to, to react would be or to act would be, unable to recall whether or not there's a specific Bible verse that covers your current moral dilemma. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus provided a helpful tool in such a situation, a quick way to, uh, to, to determine what you may, might need to do, something that's fairly easy to remember as well. And it's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, and it's commonly referred to as the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. There was a rather legalistic college young man at one point in time. No, this is not autobiographical, just so that you know. Uh, but this rather legalistic college-aged gentleman uh, always wanted to have a scriptural basis for everything that he did. He figured that if he could cite book, chapter, and verse, then he would always be on solid ground. And, and, and that's what he wanted to do. And this, this worked well for a long, long time. But then... He started to uh, desire the affection of a certain young lady. And he would take this young lady out on a date. They would walk back to her dorm. And he, he, he really, really wanted to give her a kiss. But he could not find a Bible verse that would give him the okay to do that. And so he, uh, he, he would simply look at her longingly and say goodnight and walk away. This went on for several weeks as he, he tried to find a Bible verse that would give him the green light. Well, as I said, it went on for several weeks. He was not able to do it and, and it was really starting to bother him. And so they, they came home one evening after a date and uh, he was bidding her his traditional good night. And all of a sudden, as he was turning to leave, she grabbed him and she pulled him close and planted one right on his mouth. Ten seconds later, they broke apart and he's trying to catch his breath and regain his composure. He'd say, Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse. And she grabbed him again and was about to give him another kiss. And she said, do to others as you'd have them do to you. And boom. <laughs> Okay, that, maybe that's not the best application of, the, of what Jesus says here. <laughs> but you get the point. Was Jesus teaching anything new, though, or original by what he stated? In a way, it was something new. Let's begin this morning by looking and comparing the golden rule versus the silver rules. You see, many people have taught something similar to what Jesus teaches. Similar, but not the same. And, and these uh, are either from before the time of Jesus, some are from after the time of Jesus. But for example, the Hindu religion teaches, This is the sum of duty. Do not to others which have done to thee would cause thee pain. The Buddhist religion teaches, Hurt not others with what pains yourself. Jewish traditions from the, uh, from the Talmud, uh, states, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. The rest is commentary. Even the Muslim religion teaches, no one, is, is, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. Now, of course, to be considered a brother, there you, there's some other stuff that has to happen. We're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, but uh, some other sources that taught something fairly similar. Uh, Confucius, 
who lived in 551 to 479 BC, wrote, what you do not want others to do to you, do not do to others. In fact, that's a common misstatement of what Jesus said, but Confucius said it several centuries prior to Christ. Uh, Isocrates said, do not do to unto others what angers you have done to you by others. He lived 436 to 338 BC. Seneca, man who lived from 4 BC to 65 AD, said, treat your inferiors as you would be treated by your betters. Seneca was a man who actually was a tutor in uh, Nero's young days to him, and then later, when Nero was emperor, was an advisor of, uh, of, of Nero. Anyway, but uh, so, so many have taught something very similar to what Jesus teaches. However, what Jesus teaches, his rule was slightly different. Slightly different. Uh, Jesus requires you to do something favorably to others, while the others simply prohibit you from doing uh, something unfavorable to others. Jesus said, do unto others what you want them to do to you. The others pretty much say, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Do you see the difference there? Uh, with the others, all that is required is that you don't do bad things to other people, that you don't harm other people. With Jesus' rule, what is required is that you show kindness to others. Jesus' rule truly is the golden rule, and not just because some emperor sometime in, in, the, in, in the Roman Empire had this statement in, uh, put on a gold plaque up somewhere, you know, which is how it became known as the golden rule, but Jesus' rule really is the golden rule. Uh, the others are silver rules. They're valuable, yes. They, I mean, you know, don't hurt someone if you don't want them to hurt you back, sort of thing. That, that, that makes sense, but, but not as valuable as gold. The ones that come close to teaching what Jesus taught was that found in the, uh, the Hadith, the traditions of Islam. But then some of Islam is actually based on Things that Jesus taught 600, 600 years before Muhammad lived. Uh, some of it is not based on what Jesus taught. But some of it is based on Jesus, and this is one of those things. Also, that's stated by Seneca, who lived about the same time as Jesus. Now, I kind of wonder if maybe he wasn't influenced by the teachings of Jesus. I mean, yes, he was born in Spain, but he lived most of his life in and around Rome. And so it, it could be possible that even if it wasn't Jesus himself, but maybe, maybe Seneca heard Paul teaching or something to that effect. That may be why he fell out of favor with Nero toward the end of uh, Seneca's life. But anyway, so what Jesus taught was something, new compared, was something new compared to what many teachers had taught prior. But in another sense, it was nothing new. Rather, in a simple and easy way to remember statement, Jesus gives us a guideline for righteous conduct towards others. This is a rule that is in harmony with the law and the prophets. Matthew 5, 20 through 48 is part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives. And Jesus taught a standard of righteousness that contrasted with the scribes and the Pharisees. In fact, if you look at Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but it was in harmony with what the law and the prophets actually taught. Uh, this one rule... This one rule that Jesus gives here summarizes what the law and the prophets had to say. And, and later, as Jesus works through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 21, uh, he talks a little bit about that, whether it has to do with anger, lust, divorce, or oaths, whether it has to do with uh, about retaliation on your enemy or loving your enemy. This one single rule will govern all of those situations. In fact, Romans 13, 8 through 10, 
uh, says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, or any other commandments are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So this guideline, this, this rule this, uh, for righteous conduct toward others is in harmony with the law and the prophets, but we see something else here as well. It's in harmony also with loving your neighbor. I'm going to look back at Matthew 7, beginning in verse 7. Just the verses leading up to when Jesus gives the golden rule. Here's what he says. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for, a bre for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts, good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now they're saying, well, wait a second, though. There's, there, there, there's, a, there's a break there in my Bible. There's a chapter heading there that says the golden rule between verse 11 and verse 12. Yes, but that chapter heading wasn't put there by the original author. Okay? That just helps us understand a little bit uh, a break in, in what they think is the thought. But, but in reality, verse 12 is right after verse 11. Jesus has been talking about God giving good gifts to those who ask. And he finishes with the golden rule. So what's the connection between the two? Jesus is highlighting God's love and generosity. God's grace and God's mercy. And you think about it, how often do we mess up? I mean really, really mess up. How often do we mess up, but God still gives us His love and His generosity, His grace and His mercy. To an extent, we do the same with our children. We don't necessarily always give them exactly what they want, but we lovingly provide them with what is, best, what is in their best interests. Well, Jesus takes it a step further. Okay? He says talks about God giving good gifts to us. And then he says, do to others as you would have others do to you. What if that second other is God? What if we do to others as we want God to do to us? What if we treat others the way that we are treated by God? What if we show others God's generosity, God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy? I mean, you want God to do these things for you, right? So you should do them for other people. Now, so it's a guideline for righteous conduct towards others. But how do we apply that? Some, let me, let's look at some examples of how to apply this rule. First of all, in teaching the lost. We've heard the expression, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Well, think about this. Imagine what it would be like to be told that you are wrong or that you are in sin. You know, if somebody were going to tell, tell you that or point that out to you, wouldn't you want them to do it in a loving and patient spirit? Wouldn't you want them to, to say, you know, I, I just, just sit, sit you down maybe just by yourself and say, hey, I'm concerned about this because this is what the Bible says and this is what I'm seeing. Wouldn't you want somebody to do that to you? I, yet I know some people who consider it a badge of honor to chase people away from the gospel. They, 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 they think they can, if they can make people who are in sin rebel even more that, oh, wow, I made a difference in their life. You know what? You did make a difference in their life, but it wasn't positive. Okay? It wasn't the difference that Jesus calls us to make. As you would have others persuade you to change religiously or... or, or 
If you, if you were in a sin, as you would have others uh, persuade you to change, so treat those that you seek to convert. Treat others like you want to be treated. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, Paul tells Timothy, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Did you catch that? Lord, servants not to be quarrelsome. You don't want to go looking for a fight. You see somebody that, that is living contrary to what the Word of God teaches. Yes, you need to point it out to them, but do it in a non quarrelsome spirit. In Ephesians 5, four, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 4, 15, uh, Paul writes, rather speaking the truth in love, we will, are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Some people just read speaking the truth. They forget the in love part. You speak the truth in love. But not only in teaching the lost does this rule apply, but also in correcting one another. No one likes to have their mistakes, foibles, shortcomings, whatever you want to call them. Nobody likes to have those pointed out. And when it's, but, but, but we know we all make mistakes. We all mess up. And when we do, when it's necessary, wouldn't we prefer to be approached with a meek and patient spirit? Wouldn't we, wouldn't we prefer that the person that approaches us actually understands that Matthew 18, verse 15 and following says you start with just a one-on-one -on -one con uh, conference or, or talk and everything and, and that that's the best way to start things and, and, and all and not just immediately you know, broadcast it to everybody? Approach with a meek and a patient spirit. As you would have others offer you constructive criticism, give it to them. The way you'd like to hear it, if it was you. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So in, in correcting each other, we need to have this spirit. <laughs> Excuse me. We need to have the same spirit that if we needed to be corrected, how would we want to be corrected? And then use that to, to base our actions. And finally, in treating our family, our neighbors, and our enemies. You know, everyone wants to have loving families. Everyone wants to have good neighbors. Everyone wants to not have any enemies. I mean, I hope I'm not overstating anything, but I think that that's basically true. We want to have good families, loving families, good neighbors, and no enemies. If we apply the golden rule in those relationships, then we will not only transform ourselves, we'll transform those around us as well. Family rivalries would stop if we simply applied the golden rule. Neighbor squabbles would be non-existent if we simply applied the golden rule. Our enemies would become our friends if we simply applied the golden rule. Don't limit the application of the golden rule to religious matters. It's not meant just for church things. It's meant for all things. It's not just meant for relationships at church. It's meant for relationships out in the world as well. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. Now you're wondering, I'm sure, what does all this have to do with Neighbor Day? Well, when inviting your neighbors, do you invite them with a spirit of love? Or is there some other spirit present? Do they feel like you're really trying to help them or do they feel like you're just trying to get on their case and under their skin and tell them that they're wrong and, you know, whatever? 
Do you truly practice the golden rule? Not just when it's convenient for you. Not just when you can get something out of it. But all the time. Are you always constantly uh, practicing the golden rule? Always treating others like you would like to be treated. Perhaps even treating others the way you'd want God to treat you. Edward Markham, who lived 1852 to 1940, said this, We have committed the golden rule to memory. Let us now commit it to life. This reflects what is true for most people. If you ask them what the golden rule is, they can tell you. They may say, why the golden rule? He who has the gold makes the rules. No, that's not the golden rule. And they know that. Most people would, would know, do to others as you would have them do to you. If Jesus is truly our Lord, then his golden rule will govern every aspect of our life. Does his golden rule govern your life? Have you been following his golden rule in your life? Not just in some areas of your life, but in every area of your life. See, a lot of people have a misconception that when you give yourself to Jesus, when you, give, when you, you pledge yourself to Jesus to serve him, that that means you have to give up an hour, maybe two on Sunday morning, and the rest of the time is yours. Jesus isn't interested in in people serving him, following him for two hours on Sunday. He's interested in people who are going to follow him every hour of every day for the rest of their life. So are you following Jesus? Are you practicing not just his golden rule, but his rule to live as he would have you live? If not, something needs to change. And here's the thing. His rules aren't going to change. Our lives need to change. And our lives can change. The gospel of Jesus has a transforming power. It can transform your life today. Maybe you've never made him your Lord. Maybe you've never been immersed in the watery grave of baptism to have your sins washed away. And if so, now is the time, the perfect time for you to do that. To make that commitment. Maybe you made the commitment, but you haven't really been as good about following it as you maybe should have been. And maybe what you need to do is make things right between you and God, just privately and personally, right where you're at. And if so, then, then do that. Or maybe it requires a public response, whatever, that whatever is required, so that when you leave here, you know that you are right with God. Don't let anything keep you from making that response. If we can help you by coming through a public response, why don't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together.